Psalm 69. If you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and be turning uh, to that. <clears throat> psalm 69 is a uh, psalm of David, um, written by David to the chief musician. Uh, it is a, a psalm uh, that, um, if when you're reading it, uh, you can kind of see uh, hints of our Lord and Savior in these scriptures too. You can, they're, they're, um, some of these verses say certain things that kind of um, uh, sent off flags. They did to me. Um, I think it, you would agree uh, if you've read these uh, verses, they would, it, it does the same thing. It's so David is feeling the emotional and the physical uh, um, weariness, the heaviness, of his enemies uh, attacking, so he pleads with God to save him from these enemies. He wants God to uh, to give him strength, uh, and not only that, but to also uh, to defeat his enemies for him, to get rid of his uh, enemies uh, uh, from his life, and so that he can be that servant that God had called him to be. So the weight of his enemy's unjust acts and the pressures of being a king of God's people are starting to weigh heavy on his heart. And so I believe uh, we can uh, relate uh, to David in some ways, maybe not as uh, much uh, as far as being king and, and all that, but we too uh, struggle with things in our own life, with our families and you know our work life, um, it can be anything um, uh, that can cause, you know, weary, or it can cause worries, uh, it can cause anxieties. Uh, there's several things uh, that we go through, uh, the king, that we can go through that can cause us to just like panic sometimes. And so we can kind of relate to uh, David wanting God to come in and to save him as the very first verse um, kind of uh, hints that it says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. And so I think we've all kind of been there uh, sometimes uh, in, in one, some part of your life, or if you're, not, if you're going through it now or have gone through it. We all can kind of understand that cry. David cries out, uh, Save me. Oh God, for the waters have come up to my neck. And that neck uh, has an, another word for neck could be soul. Uh, so you can replace that with soul. For the waters come up to my soul. So he's starting to feel the effects uh, of his enemies uh, uh, trying to wrongfully attack him. So David cries out for that, for, for God to save him. The only one uh, that he knows that he can cry out to. Uh, David says that they unjustly attack him. They have no cause. He's not done anything specific uh, to these enemies uh, to, to warrant their attack on him. Uh, it's just um, um, they don't like him uh, and, and they want him out uh, of the kingdom. And so uh, that's what uh, sin, I mean, that's an effect of sin, I, I believe. Uh, is our relationships not only with God, but our relationships with each other are broken. We don't treat mankind the way we should. And so he's not being treated fairly. And, and he says it's an unjust, uh, fair, it's an unjust attack. They have no cause whatsoever. So he's being physically attacked. He's being, and it affects him emotionally uh, as well. Jesus also felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. You know, we're told uh, in Isaiah 9, uh, chapter 6, that, the, that, he is the, that he would be born and that the weight of the world, the government will be upon his shoulder. The weight of the world will be upon him and upon his sh shoulder. And of course, it was when he went uh, to the cross. He felt the weight of the world upon his uh, shoulder. So he too felt the same things that David felt uh, in this psalm. He went through that same uh, process. In, in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, verse 7 through 8, it tells us who in the days 
of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And that's talking about our Lord uh, Jesus Christ in these verses. God, Jesus prayed to, the, to God the Father who had the power um, to do anything, right? To save him uh, from, uh, from suffering, but we know he had to come and uh, to suffer, but yet he prayed and still had to suffer the things that he had to go through on the cross. He felt that weight of, that, uh, of the heaviness of sin and the hatred uh, that, he, uh, uh, that he met uh, his own, it says, rejected him. His own family rejected him. And he felt all these things. Uh, as, as human side of him, he felt all of this. And it was heavy on his uh, soul as well. So knowing that Jesus also went through those same things. Verse 2 says, uh, I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me and so David feels like the, uh, the I don't know if you've ever um, uh, not just stepped in just mud but uh, sometimes when me and uh, my brother would go uh, hunting sometimes behind my grandma's them house on this creek uh, I stepped and, and it felt like quicksand I never uh, I didn't know it was mud and I could hardly get out uh, it, I, my shoe I left my shoe behind <laughs> when I did get out and uh, it, it was not a pleasant thing and it was not a fun thing at the time it was kind of scary but that's just a little bit of, a, uh, uh, of an example of what David is feeling like it says he feels like the, the ground beneath him in other words is not solid it's like quicksand uh, he feels trapped and any movement it just pulls him down further and further and further the more he struggled the deeper uh, he feels that he's being pulled down that that weight uh, 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 that's been upon him and so he uh, we serve a savior uh, as, as well who also experienced the same hurts and the struggles uh, as David did and as we do uh, today uh, he, he went through those same things. He sits, it says, uh, right now on the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for us daily on our behalf. And so he's praying for us, and they're rooting for us uh, to just keep the faith, to keep our heads up high, and don't allow the, the circumstances in our life to weigh us down and feel like it's pulling us down like this uh, quicksand or like the waters that gets up around our necks like we feel like we're going to drown. Verse 3 says, I'm weary uh, with my crying, my throat is dry, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. David was, has prayed, it says, to the point that his, his mouth is dry, his throat is dry. Um, if, if you can kind of get that picture of Jesus that day, when he was in the Mount of Olives and he, he in, the, uh, uh, in Gethsemane when he was praying with his disciples and it said that he, he sweat dropped of, drops of blood that uh, when he prayed he was in such um, like emotional stress uh, at that particular time praying for strength and I think he was praying for us and he was praying for his disciples he was praying for those who would later um, become Christians uh, who would accept him as Lord and Savior. He knew the days that were lying, lying ahead for them was not going to be easy. Even the days that he was facing was not easy. But yet uh, he prayed. So prayer is a very important part of our Christian's life. We need to be about praying. We need to be about more praying, about uh, praying for our fellow um, uh, believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ, for a lost world to use us to be that light um, to a world that needs him more uh, today. We need to do what David is doing, and we cry out uh, to God as well. So it's not just, uh, you know, he, 
it was a five minutes or so before he went to bed. He said a little prayer, and that was it. It weighed heavy on him. Uh, David was concerned about uh, not only himself but about God's people as well. So, because he he was the leader, he was the king uh, of God's people, and so. He's also concerned about them. So he prays or intercedes uh, for others as well as our Lord and Savior intercedes for us. Verse 4 says that they hate me. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. So, his, so there are many. It's not just a, you know, a couple people or a few people. He says there are more than the hairs of his head. He, his, in other words, I think he's just saying they are numerous. They're all around him. They are mighty, he says, uh, who would destroy me. So these are not weak people. These are people with power. Uh, it could be political people. It could be other nations uh, that surrounded them with armies as, as strong as theirs. Uh, so these are people that are influential. They are strong. They are mighty. Uh, they are not weak. And they are just pounding at him, trying to get him. It says, being my enemies wrongly. Again, that's a, that's a cry that they're unjustly uh, accusing him. Don't this sound uh, just like our Lord and Savior? Didn't they unjustly accuse him of being things that he was not? Didn't they accuse him of blaspheming and he was not? Because he did certain things. He healed people on the Sabbath. They didn't like that. That, that was uh, against their law, you know, when he, he did such uh, things as that. Eating uh, his disciples, supposedly eating with unclean hands. They didn't like that. They were all about the, the rituals. They were all about the check the boxes. You know, you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. And they forget that they were supposed to be loving others as they loved themselves. They were supposed to be loving their neighbors. They were supposed to be taking care of the widows. Uh, they were supposed to be taking care of the orphans, but they did not do those things. So he says, they are being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Jesus did not cause anybody to sin. He didn't cause anybody to, uh, to uh, mistreat others. He didn't cause anybody to do those things. But yet he came to restore Sin. He came to take care of sin, to restore life, to give people the opportunity to have life and to have it abundantly. So he restored that which he did not break down. Does that make sense? And that's what David is saying in a nutshell here. I'm having to restore something that I had nothing, I didn't have nothing to do with. I didn't tear it down, but yet I still have to restore it. And that's exactly what Jesus did for you and I. He came and restored things that he did not break down. And he did it because he loved us. David did it because he loved the people. He loved God. And God meant something to him. And so therefore, he allowed God to use him and in this, uh, this role of being king. He allowed God to use him to lead a people uh, that he didn't ask for. He was appointed to do. And he did it lovingly. And Jesus did the same thing. He came to this earth and he died on a cross. He did it willingly. He gave up his life willingly. He left heaven willingly became man, became weak, so that we could be strong. And that's what, uh, that's a picture that parallels uh, Jesus Christ in these verses. John 15, verse 23, 25 says, uh, reminds us that Jesus reminds us, He who hates me hates my Father also. If I have done, uh, if I have not done nothing among them, the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So even Jesus is saying, the world hated me before he hated us, before, he hate, before they hated Christians, before they hated anything to do uh, with God today, Jesus reminds us that they hated him first. Verse 5 says, O oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Now we know 
that, uh, that Jesus uh, did not have any foolishness. Uh, so we, I wouldn't say that particular verse as applying to him. Uh, but yet he did become sin for us, did he not? He did become sin for us. Uh, he, all sin, he became sin. And so when he went to the cross and he shed his blood, it was shed for all sins once and for all. He satisfied the wrath of God was poured on him to satisfy that sin debt. And that's what Jesus done for you and I. David is being open, uh, I believe, with God at this point uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, psalm. He's letting God know. He knows that he can't hide anything uh, from God anyway. Because he says, my sins are not hidden from you. You know everything about me, God. You know who I am. You know my weaknesses. My, you know what, uh, what, I, what caused me to stumble. Uh, you know my strengths. Uh, you know what I'm capable of being. Uh, even though I may not be, but you do. So David is acknowledging that he cannot hide anything um, from God. He's not wishing to hide anything from God because God is all-knowing. And so he's from earnestly praying from his heart that God listen, that God save, and God move uh, in his life and, his, and the people's life. Verse 6 says, Let not those... Who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. I believe David is saying, uh, don't let me uh, or the appearance of, of my defeat, you know, because he's king, right? You know, your king is supposed to be the strongest. He's supposed to be the leader. He's, you know, he's not supposed to be, uh, seem weak. Uh, but when he, if he's weak to the people, he's afraid that the people might sense that and fail themselves because of him. And so he says, don't let me be a stumbling block. Don't let me be a cause of your people failing you. Strengthen me. Strengthen them. Be with all of us. You know, that's what he's asking. Uh, he's asking that, that, that God help him. David is the king. He's the leader. He's like, the, he's the shepherd of God's people, and if the shepherd fails, then who, then the sheep are going to fail, right? If the shepherd ain't good, the she, the sheep is going to perish. And so, and the Bible tells us that's one problem that we had is the sheep or the shepherds that were shepherding us are not perfect. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do, and the sheep was was being malnourished. They won't being taken care of when when. When the enemies come, the shepherd would run. They wouldn't protect the sheep. And Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm not going to leave you. I'm, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be beside you. And see, David, he's, he's aware of this. He knows what it means to be a shepherd to sheep. And now he's understanding and learning what it means to be a shepherd to God's uh, people. David wants God to intervene so he does not appear weak and cause others to stumble. We don't want to be a stumbling block either. What if, our, if we're living our life contrary to the way God wants us to leave, we could be a stumbling block for somebody out there that's watching us. And you don't never know who they are. And they do watch. They do watch. People at your workplace, they watch how you react. Your family, even in your family, when you're in your family gathering, especially at Christmas time, perfect time, when you're around family, they watch. They see how you react. They see how you respond. And we have to always guard ourselves. We have to be mindful of those around us and let that light, if you're a Christian, you let that light of God shine through you that others may see Christ in you. Verse 7 says, because of your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. David says, my enemies hate me because of my faithfulness to God. You know, because, of, because he loves God. Uh, because of your sake, he says, I'm, I have borne reproach. Because I followed you. Because uh, I don't like to see uh, you mistreated. I don't like to see when the people is doing something wrong towards you, and I let them know about it, they don't like me. 
Is that not what Jesus did when he entered the, uh, Jerusalem? He went into the house of God and Jesus was upset because he says, you've turned my father's house into a, to a den of thieves. And he says, my father's house should be a house of prayer. Is that not what he said? In, uh, uh, and I had this verse in a, in a minute. I'm going to bring that up. Well, we'll go ahead. You can go ahead. Matthew 21, 13. He says uh, to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. And see, this is, this is what uh, David, he says, because of my, my, my love for you, because of my zeal uh, for you, I have borne reproach, reproach upon myself. Verse 8 says, I have become a stranger uh, to my brothers and, I, and I'm an alien to my mother's children. I become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Did not Jesus' bro uh, brothers uh, hate him? They didn't have anything to do with him at first. Uh, maybe because they were jealous, I don't know. Uh, but they were not always for him. It was later on in their life uh, they start really knowing who their brother Jesus really was. And they understood him as, the, his, as their Lord, as their Savior. And then they were on board, but not at first. Even Jesus' closest disciples, did they not betray him? Did they not leave him at the most vulnerable time in his life when he was uh, going to the cross? Did they not watch from a distance? Peter denied him three times. They were not with him by his side through all of that. They watched from a distance. All of David felt those same things in his own life with his own closest uh, people to him. And Jesus also experienced those same things in his life. Let's read verses 9 uh, through 12. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. David brought hatred, he says, uh, of, among himself. Because, of his, because he expected the people to live godly. He expected the people to live the way God wanted them uh, to live. That was one of David's, uh, that God used David for, was to gather the sheep together, to bring them back together so that they could serve and worship the, on, the one and true God. So that the, they could worship the temple. They could worship uh, the time, in the tabernacles. Eventually his son would build the permanent temple, but that's what he did. He gathered them all under one nation, you know, to be a strong nation for God. He had a zeal for God. We need a zeal for God's house as well. David loved the Lord, and when the people dishonored the Lord, it hurt David. And Jesus also was the same way. When the people dishonored God, it hurt him. And he wants nothing more but than the people to love God the Father. That he wants people to love him, to know who he is. And they will eventually know who he really is after he um, uh, uh, goes to the cross. But when, in Matthew 21, 13, when we read a while ago, that verse when he says that my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves actually came from Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11. That verse he quoted from, so I'm going to read 8 through 11, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. You will steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know. And then, he says, come and stand before me in this house, talking about the, the God's house. You come into this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says 
the Lord. Jesus quoted Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, when he uh, cleansed the temple. And so he was all about doing the things of God. Jesus prayed earnestly for the sinfulness of the people. He prayed for strength to carry out the will of the Father. And we also need to be about the same thing. We need a zeal for God. We need to, to, we need to hurt when people mistreat God, mistreat His name, and they, don't, and they don't act right. We need to lovingly let people know the truth about who Jesus is and why He came. Verses 13 through 15. It says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut its mouth on me. David knows or now turns to the Lord and he says, but for me, I'm pray my prayer is to you. He knows that the Lord is the only one that he can turn to. He knows that the Lord is the only one that he can actually pray to that's not going to change, that's not going to leave him, that understands uh, what's coming, what he's going through. He knows that the Lord hears his prayer. He knows the Lord is concerned about sinfulness, uh, about hatred, about unjust uh, acts. Uh, he knows God does not like those things. And so he prays to him, O oh Lord, uh, in the acceptable time, in your time, in other words, Lord, I know uh, you're going to deliver me. You're going to help me. You're going to take care of me. I'm going to be what you want me to be at one day. But that doesn't make it easy, does it? Uh, we still have to go through this life. We still go through the trials uh, that we have to go through. But we know at the right time, God will get us through to the end. And this is what David is praying here. Be merciful to me and de deliver me in your time. David says, deliver me out of the mire, out of the mud, out of the quicksand, out of those things that tend to pull me down or weigh me down, cause me not to be able to be, to be stable, to be firm. Help me to be firm um, in, your world, in your works, in what you would have me to do so that my enemies won't overtake me. Uh, he says, let me, at the end of verse 15, and let not the pit. Uh, that's a, another word for the grave or Sheol uh, in the Old Testament. They use Sheol. It's another word for the grave. Don't let the grave consume me. Don't let the grave overpower me. And we know that the grave did not overpower Jesus. When he died, it says in three days he arose. The grave could not hold him there. It didn't overpower him. He, he arose and he arose victorious and David knows because he says I'm praying to you I know that in your time in the right time you're going to raise me up victorious over my enemies Jesus was raised victorious over his enemies over the, uh, the those who were against him verses 16 through 18 hear me O Lord your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul. Redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. David urges God to, to listen uh, to his prayer and to deliver him out of the hands of his enemies. Jesus prayed for strength. And God delivered him uh, from the cross and delivered him from the grave as well. And so he wants a speedy recovery, David does. And he does, and, and he gets it. Eventually, David uh, is delivered from his enemies. And he is, uh, sits back on his throne. And the people do uh, prosper and they do grow and they do become a, a great nation uh, for a short period of time. 
uh, they do uh, prosper. So we will prosper one day as well. Verses uh, 19 through 21. It says, you know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Sounds familiar at the end there? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's like hints of, of, of our Lord and Savior all throughout uh, these verses. Uh, things that he went through, things that he experienced uh, while on that cross. Uh, he also went through these same things uh, that David speaks of uh, here. He had, uh, like I said, his closest disciples deserted him. There were none there uh, beside him to comfort him at that time. He was alone. And the, even the father turned his face uh, on his son while he was on the cross. At that, in the, the darkest hour of his, life, of his life when sin was on him. And he became sin for us who knew no sin, the Bible says. So he experienced similar things. Verses 22 through 28, um, it says uh, he is praying for the enemies uh, to the traps that they use, the pits that they dig, the weapons that they use, that they be, that they be uh, traps to them own selves. And so here we go, let their, in verses 22, let their table become a snare before them and their well-being a trap. Let their eye be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. No, let no one live in their tents. For they persecute the ones you have struck and talk, to the, and, and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Uh, that sounds kind of harsh, don't it, uh, these words, what David is wanting God uh, to do to his enemies. I think this is a contrast between uh, David being man and Jesus being he was the son of man, but he was also the son of God. Jesus did not pray for annihilation of his enemies. Like David is praying. This is the man's side, I think. Jesus said, forgive them, God. Forgive them, Lord, for they do not know what they do. He asked forgiveness for his enemies while he was being persecuted. That's a difference, right? Uh, it's nothing wrong with what David was asking at the time. Because one, God did use him. He did put him on the throne. And he was not put on the throne to fail. He was not put on the throne for the nation of Israel to suffer and to, and to be annihilated. That was not the purpose that God put him on the throne to start with. David learned strength. David learned to be obedient. As the scripture says, it was through the sufferings that Jesus learned obedience. It was through the sufferings that David learned obedience. And so he's, he's obedient to God. God, he's already says, God knows my heart. He knows my, my, whether I'm my sinfulness. But he also knows that I am a loving, that I love the people, and I want nothing best for the people. I have no doubt that if God decided to save uh, David's enemies, that David would have had no problem calling them brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't think he would have had no problem with that. But also uh, God knows whether you're going to uh, be that kind of person or not. God knows whether you're going to accept him or not. David may not know. God knows. And so Jesus prays for his enemies where David is asking God to deliver him from his enemies uh, and do it swiftly. And in the last verses 29 through 36 
but I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves. The humble shall uh, see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise the prisoners. Let, the, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. And David believed that the Lord would deliver him as he had done in the past. But this does not make life easy. It's still hard. We still struggle. The Bible describes the Lord as the suffering servant, a man of sorrows. But he was raised from the grave and sin was defeated. This should cause all of us to want to sing praises to God, to give him thanks every day. We should always be thankful for what, what he has done for us and what he's going to do for us. When, when the world sees how the children of God responds to the difficulties of this life, it could be a testimony to them. It might be the only testimony that they will ever see and cause them to seek God as well. The Lord does hear our prayers and he does uh, defeat our enemies. Jesus defeated death. And now he reigns, it says, over all. It says that all authority had been given to him. And that there's no one that, will, that, that we need to go through, that we, that we can go to, to be saved, that we may enter the gates of heaven. We have to go through Jesus Christ. So let, the be, let us be faithful in how we live our life. Let us do the work that the Lord has called us to do. And we will be with, and we will be, uh, he will be with us until he comes back for us all. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for this lesson. We thank you, Lord, for Psalm 69. We thank you for the reminder that uh, life is tough and it's not always uh, easy. But God, that we can be like David and we can trust and we can pray to you, to the only one that can help us. Lord, we know that you can help us to and reveal to us those things that, that are hindrances in our life, those things that we need to let go, those things that we need to turn away from so that you can grow us to be the Christians that you would have us to be and to live the life that you would have us to live. Help us to be faithful and be that salt and light that you have called us, your children, to be, and we'll give you the praise and the glory in all that you do. In your name we pray. Amen.